my name is Julie Ann Link and welcome to the Music Link. This week on the Let's Link project, I'd like to welcome Rufus Olivier. Thank you so much for being here, Rufus. It's great to be here. Um, here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> to start out, Rufus, could you please share with us who you are and an overview of what you do as a professional musician? Absolutely. My name is Rufus Olivier. I am a bassoonist, a professional bassoonist. And um, um, I started out in Los Angeles. I was playing with the LA Philharmonic for a little while. And then I joined the San Francisco Symphony in 1977. Then in 1980, I became principal bassoon of the San Francisco Opera. And then in 19... 90, I think it was, I became principal bassoon of the San Francisco Ballet. And that's what I've been doing ever since. So we're coming up on almost 45 years of, of exhaling for money. <laughs> <laughs> the coolest yeah. job, right? <laughs> yeah, the coolest job we could ever have, you know, and, and unless you're the bassoon player. But uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rufus, could you tell us more about where you grew up in California? Sure, sure. I grew up in uh, the town. I was born in the town of Watts, California, which is popularly known as South Central, which I could easily say I'm straight out of Compton, basically. So Watts and Compton were right together. So I grew up there and... Um, and that's pretty much where I grew up, you know, in Los Angeles until I was about uh, 21, until I moved to San Francisco. Yeah. And Rufus, could you share with us how you got introduced to music and the bassoon? Was that in the California band system? It was, it was. It was, um, you know, my, my father had played the saxophone before World War II and my sister was a violinist, my older sister, so I had this music in the house. Uh, I never really heard my father play, but I heard that violin all the time, you know, and before I could talk, I heard violin. So by the time I got to junior high school, they uh, put me in there and gave me a, I think it was a saxophone I had to play. But one day I heard a production of The Sound of Music that my school was doing. It was a very good music school, junior high school in Los Angeles. A lot of good music in LA. And I was sitting in the audience listening to this orchestra and I'd heard my sister's orchestra and I thought to myself, I think I need some of that, you know? So I went to the teacher, I says, you know, I know there are no saxophones in the orchestra. And I think it was seventh grade, seventh or eighth grade, but I want to play in an orchestra. I like the sounds. And she told me, she says, well, because that sound of music was just knocking my socks off. And I, and she says, well, we'll put you on the oboe. And I thought to myself, oboe? <laughs> and I said, you know what? I'm going to take one for the team. I'll play the oboe if you want me to play the oboe. So I went to get my oboe. And I told the guy, I'm here for my oboe. And they said, we're out of those. Take this bassoon. And that's how I became a bassoonist. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So uh, that that whole thing. And uh, just a little side story. Many, many years later, we're doing um, a Dead Men Walking opera. And, of course, a lot of people from Hollywood were coming. And they were filming Prince's Diaries with Julie Andrews in San Francisco with Gary Marshall. So afterwards, there's a little party, and I'm standing there, and Gary Marshall walks up to me and introduces himself. Hello, you know, how you doing, Gary Marshall? I'm, yeah, I'm a bassoon player. And then I said, you know, I have to talk to Julie Andrews. And he says, well, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you. I said, I, just for a second, that's all I need. So he takes me up to Julie Andrews. This is Rufus Olivier, he's a bassoon player. I, said, I told her, I said, ma'am, I'm a bassoon player here. And it's because of you. And, and she went, what? Well, actually, went, what? And I said, 
I heard your sound of music and I just had to be in an orchestra and I never forget that. And she started crying right there in front of me, but I thanked her for that, you know? So it all, it all connected one day, you know, I got to thank somebody for something. So yeah, it was great. Rufus, I love hearing that your story, the full circle of, of uh, how the sound of music, you know, brought you to music and, and, and getting to meet Julie finally. How special. Oh, yeah. Just who knew, you know, who knew? You mm -hmm. know I mean? so. Wow. And then 45 years, you know, <laughs> of experience oh, and love and yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot, of, a lot of that. And quite frankly, for the most part, it's all been really good. I yeah. Mean, you know, I, I can't, I'm not going to complain about anything because it's, I mean, you're, you're making music, you know, mm -hmm. making a living, playing music and working. I'm working with the most incredible people in the world, in the mm -hmm. world. They're sitting right next to me, you know? So, uh, yeah. It's, 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 a, it's miraculous. I love it. Rufus, could you share with us about the schools, music schools that you decided to go to and what the, the programs were like there? Sure. Well, um, my, my whole education actually comes off of a bulletin board, mostly. So like, like for instance, the junior high school, um, I saw a little posted PTA hundred dollars you can take lessons so I tried out for that and I got the hundred dollars and I got to take lessons over at USC you know with the Ray Nolan beautiful man beautiful bassoon player so every Friday I would hop on two buses and take a half an hour lesson with Mr. Nolan and um I did that in junior high so I was getting those lessons then I, um, one day, Mr. Nolan asked if he could drive me home. And I said, are you kidding? <laughs> of course you could drive <laughs> I have to take two buses. So he drove me home and he said, can I talk to your mother? I said, sure. She's a nice lady. And so <laughs> he comes in and I'm standing there. And Mom, this is Mr. Nolan. I take bassoon lessons from him, you know. I know, of course. And he told her, Mrs. Olivier, I think your son could actually make a living doing this. Well, I was shocked. <laughs> My mother, <laughs> so I said, oh, okay. Well, wonderful. Well, gee, I didn't, why didn't you tell me, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, so I went on from there to high school. And one day the uh, LA Philharmonic came to my high school. And I'm sitting, he allowed me to sit in the section. I'm sitting in between Wal Ritchie, and David Bragenthal, two of the greatest bassoon players on the planet. And I'm just sitting there hanging, you know, and they're playing the marriage of Figaro, and I'm watching. Yeah, this is good. This is good. And so uh, again, something on the bulletin board. LA Philharmonic has a program for minority students in Los Angeles. I hop on the bus, I go down to the music center, audition, and I get in. All of a sudden, I'm taking lessons from Bridenthal, you know, and they're, they're paying for my lessons and everything. And eventually that led to them hiring me in the orchestra to play all the time. You know, I was about 16, 17, and then Zubin asked me to do a concerto. I said, I'm your guy, you know? <laughs> And so uh, it just sort of moved on from there. That's really, that's really my education. So I went from that, playing with them a lot, to auditioning for the symphony and going into San Francisco. So I actually never went to college. Uh, I never went to music school. So I'm, I'm a little illiterate. I'm, I have a little complex about that. But uh, so that's... Like I said, my education comes from bulletin boards, you know. I was mentored, let's say. I, you yes. know, I had great mentors and great tormentors. But I had... <laughs> <laughs> I had great mentors. And, um, you know, Dave Bridenthal, 
like my brother and uh, Ray Nolan was uh, I can't describe what a kind man he was you know he played for Warner Brothers all the cartoons you hear all the Looney Tunes and one of the kindest men on the on the face of the earth and same with David um, to this day we we talk every week or every two weeks and hang and stuff like that so um, yeah I, I was very blessed to have that um, real um, real working, teaching, you know, actually doing the job and learning at the same time. It was a blessing. Yeah. Rufus, could you share a bit more about how these bassoon players influenced you? Well, yeah, well, um, like I said, Mr. Nolan, he played with Warner Brothers, which fascinated me, you know, he played all, he was a contract player with Warner Brothers. And again, uh, just a soft-spoken, kind-hearted fellow. And, um, he, he, uh, it was just so encouraging and, and warm, you know? And so when I went on to Breidenthal, it was the same thing, very kind, very soft-spoken, but I got to hang out with him a lot, you know, cause I was working with him. I was going to lunch. I was hanging out, going places with him. And there was one day we're sitting in a restaurant and you know, I had never been in a restaurant in my life. And I just looked at him and I said, Mr. Bernthal, I want your lifestyle. <laughs> this is what I want. <laughs> he just sort of smiled, you know, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I always knew I was going to be a musician since uh, I think since I was six years old, but I, it was at that point where um, I was going to be a bassoonist in some orchestra somewhere, even if it was on the moon. And uh, it was at that point where it was more than just playing the orchestra. It was a whole lifestyle. It was, it was a, a way of living, a way of, of, of being with other people, with other musicians and enjoying other. And um, I remember once we're playing Mahler's eighth or something, some huge thing at the Hollywood Bowl. And Eric Leinsdorf is the conductor. And I'm, I'm all of, I don't know, I'm 18 or something. So I'm playing fourth. I'm sitting down at the bot back there and everything's going. The chorus is going, the orchestra's going, the thing is just blasting. And then the bassoon guys, is Alan Goodman, Walt Ritchie, Dave Breitenthal, Fred Dutton, they tell, you know, they're clowning around, laughing. So, of course, I'm laughing. I'm, you know, these are my mentors, right? All of a sudden, all of the music stops. And I'm still doubled over. Everything stops. And Leindorf looks straight at me and he says, young man, could you share with us what's so funny? And I look to my left and every one of those bassoon players, straight face, nothing. They set me up and <laughs> I, I got clobbered by my, um, sorry, sir. <laughs> I'm like, that's when I learned you will not be rescued by your colleagues if you get in trouble with a conductor. Uh -huh. You are on your own. <laughs> so that was a huge lesson. <laughs> so yeah, so that was a... I'll never forget that, ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, the parallel, the t mentors and the tormentors. <laughs> the tormentors, yes. Holy mackerel, what's going on? You know. mm -hmm. So, yeah. But, so, uh, and, you know, like I said, I was treated uh, to this day, you know, we're almost like fam family, you know, I, I, uh, I named my son, his middle name is David after Bridenthal. His daughter, his first name is Olivia after me, <laughs> you know, so we, we have a really nice, he's like a big brother to me, you know, sort of a thing. So it's, it's, it's really nice. And, um. We hardly ever talk about music. I mean, ever when we're, we're talking. <laughs> so anyway, but yeah. Rufus, could you share any tips or advice about what you've learned about the music industry? You know, when I grew up in Los Angeles, of course, and so there was that industry, there was that, um, mm -hmm. 
Hollywood side of the industry, the studio musicians, and the studio musicians, by the way, are magnificent. I mean, these these are A class musicians, you know. And and sometimes you just have to choose your path, you know, if it doesn't choose you. And I had opportunities. I did a few things in the studio, but in my head, I chose I chose the symphonic route because I just wanted to play the rest of my life, and I didn't care if it wasn't as much money as the uh, studio. I didn't care. I said I just I would rather just make a living the rest of my life than just hit hard and then never play again at thirty or something, you know, rock and roll, whatever. I just and and um, for me it worked out right. So if I were to tell anybody anything, I just be true to yourself. You know, be you, and if something doesn't feel right, just don't do it. Um, just don't do it for you. You know, do what you do. Do what you do. And, um, you know, it just feels right in your body, and, and, and it's paid off for me very well. More than my, my dream is was here, you know, and the things that have happened are here. You see what I mean? So I met my dream at 21 when I got into into the orchestra. But the things that have happened since then are way beyond what I would have ever imagined. Ever. I, I, I had no imagination that way. You know, the kids, the wife, all of you know, and the great things that come with all that. And um, so um, you just never, never know. You know, you, you're, you're going for your dream, but you end up surpassing what you even dreamed of you, mm -hmm. know? you made it to the moon rufus <laughs> I made it to the moon. <laughs> i'd like to go there now to be honest yes but yeah <laughs> just i'd love to go with you yes <laughs> oh, just for a little break <laughs> <laughs> oh yes <laughs> go to the moon have a little coffee or cigar you know but yeah so yeah Rufus, could you share with us more about your teaching career and any of your teaching philosophies? Yes, I can. Um, so I've been, I, I, I started teaching at the Los Angeles City College and it was because um, I had started going there and at about six months in, I was able to, with the help of someone, afford a bassoon. I bought a heckle bassoon. And the reason why I had been, I'd been sort of courted by some of these schools and they were offering these heckle bassoons. You can play this bassoon if you come here, you can play this. And once I bought a bassoon, I just went into the office and says, I'm out of here. You know, <laughs> and they says, wait, don't go. You can teach here. You'll be the bassoon teacher for us if you stay and play in the orchestra or something like that. And so I did, I did that. And over the years, um, I was very confused. I would say this from 19 or 20 to almost 30, I was confused on what, on the way I should be, how I should teach. Should I be harsh? Should I, what should I, should I pound them into the ground? Should I make them cry? And then um, it all it all came together. I think, in men general, about thirties when we sort of our brain sort of solidifies. It all came together when I realized I have to teach the way I was taught. You know, that's all I know. That's all I know. I had two teachers. Both of them are gentlemen and were very kind to me. Huh. So. I, I just cannot make a person cry. <laughs> I cannot pound someone into the ground. I don't know how to do it. It's foreign. I, I've never had it done to me. And so I don't know how to do that. So my teaching style, no matter what's going on, is to point out what a person did good and help them with what they're doing bad. This was great. You did good. Now let's work on this. This you know, and I, and, and that I've had some students say, I'm not hard enough. He said, my teacher used to punch me out, you know? And I said, well, you have to go back to that teacher. 
you just have to go because I'm not going to punch you out. <laughs> you know? And 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 we're at another level here. You know, we're at another level. We're talking about music now, not you know. And uh, I won't do it if you want somebody to pound you into the ground. Go find that. But you come to me. I am a positive, positive teacher. I am not going to make you cry. This is not an advertisement because I don't even <laughs> know if I even like teaching. But uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm just saying, I'm just not going to do that. We're gonna we're gonna accentuate the good stuff, work on the bad stuff, and 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 support that. And that's my style, and that's what I, how I learned. I learned with with people like that, and if they were that good, you know. Why not? Why not? Yeah. You know, for A, A class bassoon players, I, I'm going to do it the way I was taught. So oh, there it is. <laughs> it would be wonderful to hear more about your chamber music career, Rufus. Could you share with us about the different groups that you've played with? Absolutely. Um, well, for for about 30 years, I've been with the Stanford Woodwind Quintet. And so um, it, it's sort of funny. Uh, the amount of music that you can play. Now, let's say, all right, it's symphony, opera, ballet. That's a whole stack of music. I like to think of music in pounds, you know? It's pounds and pounds of music. Well, one day I was, I was, um, I don't know, I, I, I have this bag of music for the quintet. It's quintet music and a good friend was with me, a uh, uh, flute player. And she said, what is that bag? It's a huge bag and it must be 35 pounds of music. And she said, oh, you carry all the music for the quintet. I said, no, this is just the bassoon part. <laughs> <laughs> this is just the bassoon music. This is just my part. And she was like, are you kidding? I says, you'd be surprised how much music you can play in a 30 year period with a group. And so um, I played every quintet known to mankind, you know, and then um, I was also had the privilege of working with a group, fantastic group. And it was funded by Anchor Steam Beer. In San Francisco, Fritz Maytag of the Maytag washer and dryer owned Anchor Steam Beer. And our oboe player in the opera was his wife's oboe teacher. And one day he says, could you form a group to do booster work in high schools and do things? And we formed the Anchor Chamber Players. And Mr. Maytag picked up the tab for everything, pianos, pay everything for 10 years. It was, it was, a it was an octet. And then we would add whatever we needed. Sometimes we would have a harp. Sometimes we would have an arrangement of a quintet and a jazz whistler and a whistler. We would, we would get arrangements, but for 10 years, again, the amount of music that you can play with an octet plus, you know, is amazing. So I played with with the anchor chamber players uh, until it disbanded for about ten years, and that was fantastic. And anchor anchor uh, steam beer, like I said, not only did they pick up the tap for the concerts they put on, they paid for any concerts that we arranged. They paid half the fee any of any gigs that we got outside of them. You see, and um, Mr. Maytag, and he's he's still around. I, I see him. But um, so Anchor Chamber Players was a huge part of, um, I, and then I had formed a little quintet or a little group called, I called it the Olivier Ensemble. And it was, I mean, the, and I say just some of the most incredible badass players you've ever seen, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and it's very hard to keep those type of, people around, you know, so we had maybe one or two things, but oh my goodness, it was electric. I mean, and of course, when everybody's that good, they're also a little nuts. So it's very hard to, you know, <laughs> I need, I, I needed a border collie to corral these people. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but it was fun. It uh -huh. was fun. You know, yeah, so it keeps the rehearsals interesting. Music, uh, if I was to give advice to any wind player, especially in bassoon player, especially play as much chamber music as you can possibly get your hands on. Chamber music, chamber music, chamber music. Because a lot of times you're sitting there in the orchestra while they rehearse the strings or something, you know, especially in junior high and high school, you're just sitting. So if you can get a little group together, you could get something, just play, play, play. I also have a little trio. It's a bassoon, tuba and piano. And that group is, it's actually the love of my life. We've been together for 30 years. And our tuba player from the opera, Karen Hutchinson, our pianist, uh, Steinway pianist. And we play whatever we want to play. We just take piano music and play it. It could be Gershwin. It could be the Beatles. It could be anything from soup to nuts. Some guys say, I want to play that tune. It could be Lachme. It could be an opera aria. And we play anything we want. And we go all over the place and play at senior centers and do things like that. And, and uh, that that that's really my soul of my of my heart. Those guys are the other side of my heartbeat because we just, you know, when you have that that unspoken connection, that's that kind of group. Yeah, the Oreo Trio. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> <laughs> at our initial concert at the conservatory, we threw cookies at the audience. That <laughs> is my kind of concert. <laughs> <laughs> Oreo cookies. So yeah, so the Oreo trio, beautiful human beings. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And it comes yeah. out. It, it comes out of them. I mean, it's just unbelievable. You'd be shocked at what a tuba player can do. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm sure it's just so gorgeous and yeah and mixed with the piano and bassoon wow oh my goodness. people people never know what they're gonna get they narrate and then they go oh, i like i actually liked it yes <laughs> i'm gonna go to a tuba bassoon concert are you kidding me i'm gonna look at a baseball game <laughs> it's like but what? they're cookies <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. so the oriental trio is, is the other it, you know, all those groups are embedded in my soul. The, the people, um, you know, all my colleagues and stuff like that. So lots and lots and lots of chamber music really help you um, and keep you going, you know, um, they keep you going, that kind of thing. Yeah. Is that enough? But, yeah, Rufus, <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah, I think too with chamber music, it's like the core, you know, or like the model we apply into orchestra and it's such deep connections and you get to really yeah. shape the music together. And that's how you learn how to play in a woodwind section. That's, that's it. That, that's what you are in the orchestra. You are a quintet, you know, you're an octet and that's where you learn how to balance and weave and push and, you know, Hi. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. Rufus, could you share with us about an audition experience? My whole philosophy of auditioning or playing an audition is either sail or crash, you know? Yes. Either go for it or just crash. Mm -hmm. Not sort of in the middle kind of guy, you know, I either win it or I lose. Boof. And so um I always thought, and I tell you I tell a lot of young folks, you know, younger folks, that why I asked them this question, why would I pick you? Mm -hmm. There's gonna be a hundred and fifty flu players here. Why should I pick you? You know, everybody can play the thing. Everybody. They play, everybody plays the instrument well. They play mm -hmm. great. What's going to make you stand out? What? The one thing we can't forget, and we're starting, we forget. It's the doggone music. It's the doggone making people feel something. You know, you're, um, my whole thing is trying to make that committee 
feel something. Feel what you're trying to do. Not just, sure, you have to have the technique. You have to have all of that. That, that I can teach a horse to do that stuff. But you, but the music part, that's going to win you the audition. The music, you know, and, and, and if you're completely equal, someone with that, that gift of making you feel something, who, who knows how to create this music, that's going to have people sit in their chair, look sideways, and go, ooh, you see what I mean? So always go for the music. Always go for the music. The music, the music, the music, the music. Um, and in and, and the words of my old boss, Lusati, for the life, yeah. you know, <laughs> music for the life. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's the only reason why you're playing the horn. Period. That's it. And uh, fortunately, I learned that very young, very young. Um, you know, I was screamed at by someone. I was playing in a little group, and one of the ladies had a fit. If you're not gonna make music, don't play. <laughs> and that stuck to me. I understood. Oh, okay. Otherwise, you're just making noise. Yeah. So, yeah, it's stuck. And and I hear that voice all the time. Mm-hmm. They're not going to say something. And don't, don't, don't even go there. So, yeah. So, make music at your auditions. Play, um, make music. Rufus, do you have any advice on coping with music performance anxiety, if that's something that you've experienced? Yes. Yes. Um, lie, lie till your pants are on fire. <laughs> if, let's say you have to, I, I, you know, I was giving this advice to a friend of mine just a month ago, and she was having to play a Mozart bazooka trill. I said, the first thing you have to do is never, ever tell anybody you're scared. Ever. And this is the most important part. Don't say it to yourself. Mm-hmm. Don't say it out loud. You don't want to hear it come into your own ears. Somebody walks up to you before a performance, say how you feel. You say, I feel great. Even if your knees are shaking, you do not tell anyone how you feel because it just translates. It makes, you know, if they think you're nervous, then they're nervous, then it goes boom. Then the audience is nervous. You got to relax that audience. You walk out there, like you own the place, even if you're about to die. The audience will relax. They will relax you. You will relax them. And then it becomes a thing, you know? So, um, um, what... And this is what I do. This is, I can't, what people have to do, um, that's, it's a personal, it's a personal thing. So that's what I do. I just I never go to the negative of fear. I never let the fear word come out of my mouth. I never, I never say it no matter what I'm thinking. I'm always pushing that demon back. You know what I mean? You got to go in the bathroom and say a prayer. Go, <laughs> you know, <laughs> go do your thing. Do what you do. And uh, uh, but that one thing is never voicing out loud uh, uh, of fear. You know, never let yourself don't say that to yourself, you know, mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. So um, um, and I also believe that, uh, you know, Rest help, believe it or not. Getting the right rest. Don't go in there tired. Tired will kill you. But you, you know, if you're rested and you're prepared, that energy of the nerves is going to put you beyond what you actually practiced. You see what I mean? You could use it to your advantage. You know how fast my tongue goes when I'm in front of people? I can't do that at home. <laughs> 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 I can't do that at home. Yeah, but boy, you put some people in. 
all over the place. <laughs> so you, you, use, you use that thing to your advantage. You judo it, you take it, and you, and you, and you turn it into, into your energy. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I say that. Yeah, now watch me go to work and blow everything tonight. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, big shot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Know It All, but yeah, you, so you use that. You use that for you. Just try and and not tell yourself that you know, and prepare as as well as you can. And no, you know, if you prepare as well as you can, even if something happens, you're not gonna feel like you know what I could have worked harder. I could have worked harder. But if you know you have pushed it to the wall, something happens. Like you know what I gave it my best shot. So, you know, <laughs> that's, that's better than, than going in and blowing it for something stupid, but just not practicing, you know? Yeah. That kind of thing. Could you share a bit about your reed making style and any <laughs> techniques? Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> My style is, you know, get as many machines to do it for you that's, what, <laughs> that's my style yes um, as you can see behind me is a plethora of tools and things and basically my reads were disaster all my career um until i think the biggest machine that helped my in my whole life was the tip machine the one that uh -huh. makes the tip. that's the one that turned the corner for me mm -hmm. doggone tip machine but I was never a great reed maker. I'm not a great reed maker. Um, I just rely on making quantity and luck. <laughs> <laughs> quantity and luck is my style. You know, there's got to be one in there that's going to work. Yes. Um, so quantity and luck. And, and uh, I just, I'm just, you know. That's just it. That's my that's my style. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love seeing your workspace, Rufus. I was going to ask, what are the cards hanging above you? Oh, all these things? Yeah. Oh, those are actually, that's glue. That's a Sharpie. That's sanding belts. That's wire. Those are actually things I use making reads and stuff cool they're, they're just they're just hanging there you know um vocals wow um, vocals uh you, you know soup to nuts and um yeah just all kinds of pencil sharpener i see that now <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool i love that it's up very handy up there pencil sharpener Yay. And uh, I don't know if you can see that in my the bassoon thing there. Yes. My student, one of my students made that for me. Uh, she's wonderful. Is that a drawing, Rufus? It's, it is. It's what she did was the, the part of the bassoon is the non-painted part. She's, it's shaped around the wood. That's just the wood in between and everything else is blacked out. Wow. Isn't that cool? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And oh, this is a lovely, a lovely student. And um, this student, I remember this student, she's, she's so nice. She used to bring, I asked her, you know, I was trying to pull things out of her. And I said, I asked her, what, what do you, what do you like to listen to? What is you? She said, I like Lady Gaga. I said, okay, your next assignment is to write some Lady Gaga duets. And she started making arrangements of Lady Gaga music and we would play it at the end of her lessons every week. Amazing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and yeah, and we got real close about, you know, so, uh, but yeah, so that's what you, okay. So we would play Lady Gaga. Yeah. 
Could you share with us any skills that are learned in music that apply to everyday life? Um, yes, don't speak unless spoken to. <laughs> Mostly by the conductor. <laughs> Just sit there. <laughs> the conductor doesn't talk to you. Don't, don't. Hey, maestro. No, no. Or just sit there. And if 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 he doesn't talk to you, then you are a success. Okay. <laughs> you just sit there. And silence is golden. Uh, and in life also, as as well as work. Um, another. I think. I think this one. And I think of it musically. We all heard the thing, treat others the way you would like to be treated. Well, you can do that musically, you know? Don't step all over the flute player solo. <laughs> don't, you know what I mean? Don't, if you have a solo, you don't want somebody over there, you know, you, you to make good music, you have to come in under there, you have to help them. You have to help them be their best. Do that in life. Help people be their best. Do the same in the music, you know, and people will want you around musically and in person. So, uh, you know, but yeah, support. I would use that, you know, treat them the way you would like to be treated musically. You know, I would use that in life. Is there any advice that you could share for musicians just starting out their music careers? Ooh, oh, Lord. Um, wow. That's hard because, that, see, for me, the music thing is so personal. Um, uh -huh. My way of doing it, I would never tell somebody to, to do it the way I did it. Never. I would, I would say, you know, get your teachers, get a, go to a good school, get, go to a conservatory, boom, boom, boom. Um, I might even tell them to get a, get a degree in something, you know, nowadays I would, I would have to, I would, you know, you, you gotta be careful out there and take care of yourself. Um, but how you, how they do it, how I did it, I, I wouldn't actually want them to follow in my footsteps or have to follow in my footsteps. Um, I, I, I think the way people are doing it now, uh, you know, getting in these nice youth orchestras, going to these camps and doing these kind of things, that's the way to, that's the way to do it. And then you'll find out if you really want to do it, you know, um, I was in, I was in do or die mode. <laughs> You know, I was just do or die. I'm going to do this or die. So I don't want people to have, they shouldn't have to be that way. But uh, so I wouldn't give them that same advice. Uh, yeah, listen to your teacher. Listen to your teacher. That's the best advice for somebody starting <laughs> out. Listen to your teacher and practice, okay? <laughs> That's my advice. Listen to your teacher. Yeah. And no matter, no matter, no matter what you think of your teacher, they all play better than you. Okay, so that's all you gotta know. <laughs> <laughs> They're better than you, so it doesn't matter. Okay, yeah. Listen to your teacher. Yeah. Is there anyone that you would be interested to suggest to be interviewed next for this project? And she teaches at University of Austin, Texas. Kristen! Whoa! Yes. Kristen. But she works so well. First of all, she's an A-class bassoonist, A-class teacher. That's, uh, but she has a heart for teaching these young people and teaching these people, working with women bassoon players and things like that. She has this huge heart for this sort of thing. I think she would be very interesting to talk to. Very interesting. Yeah, that's what I suggest. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Rufus, for your time. And it's been wonderful to get a glimpse into your life and career as a professional musician. So thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, real, real glamorous, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Real glamorous.
Tremors. Yeah. Hey, it's been a pleasure. This has been a lot of fun. You're you're delightful. Thank you, Rufus. So for everyone watching, check out Rufus's live hosting discussion session coming up this Sunday, where he's sharing more about starting a music group, the importance of cultivating a bassoon family at work, the joy of living outside of the city, ways to find time to smell the roses, and so much more. Find out more about Rufus and his work at the San Francisco Opera and Ballet websites. And feel free to reach out to Rufus anytime. I know he would love to hear from you. <laughs> Please like, comment, and share any questions or feedback in the section below. And we'd be happy to incorporate these in the live discussion. Please subscribe to this channel and turn on the bell for notifications which really helped keep the Music Link moving forward. The Music Link is a New Zealand-based resource for people around the world to share, learn, and connect through music. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see y'all in the next video.